Your eyes and your vision are under attack, damaging blue light from the sun. Your phone, your computer, your tablet, even light bulbs and car headlights is constantly bombarding you. The good news is our eyes actually already have a line of defense to counter the effects of blue light. This defense is made up of three pigments called carotenoids. MacU Health with Micromycel, the only supplement with the exclusive patent on all three macular carotenoids and Micromycel technology. Do your patients know what presbyopia is? There are people who are afraid of the press. Have you talked to your patients about multifocal contact lenses? I've heard the bifocal, but not right, multifocal. Exactly. Not multifocal. Do you need help with your multifocal strategy? Learn more at the conclusion of this episode. With more screen usage and indoor time, myopia, also known as nearsightedness, is increasing and getting worse in children. Now, certified eye doctors can prescribe my sight one day, the first and only FDA-approved soft contact lens to slow myopia progression in age-appropriate children. Visit coopervision.com to find a Brilliant Futures certified eye doctor near you. Welcome back to part two of my interview with author Patrick McCowan. In part two, Patrick discusses the power of correct breathing. If you're new here and you like our interviews, press like, subscribe, share, and hit the bell. Also, please leave comments. Be sure to watch our full-length documentary, Open Your Eyes, on Amazon Prime, Apple TV, iTunes, Google Play, and YouTube movies and shows. And how about obesity related to breathing? It seems like the more obese somebody is, the bigger their belly metabolic syndrome, the more they're going to be a mouth breather. You're correct. And it's funny, I remember reading a study, and it may be in that book, they looked at women and men, but they they found that women were more susceptible to heavier breathing because they had increased chemosensitivity to obesity. Now, there's a couple of things going on with obesity. One is sleep disorder breathing. Now, you think about how prevalent obstructive sleep apnea is. And if sleep is disrupted, it affects hormones such as leptin and ghrelin. So ghrelin stimulates appetite. It increases ghrelin, which stimulates appetite. The individual eats more because they, they're, they've got a more voracious appetite. They put on weight. As they put on weight, there's increased fat pads in the throat, which narrows the airway. The tongue gets bigger, which occupies more space in the mouth and can encroach the airway. The abdomen gets bigger, which impinges the movement of the diaphragm, which causes the more to breathe using upper chest. And when you were upper chest breathing, it reduces lung volume. And this in turn reduces the activity of the upper airway dilator muscles, which in turn is making sleep apnea worse. And people with obstructive sleep apnea can have a hard time losing weight because their sleep is feeding into their appetite. Stress can feed into this too. You know, we very often eat or we drink more alcohol to deal with stress. And the more we eat and the more alcohol we drink, well, we put on weight. Then our sleep is impacted, our breathing is impacted, and alcohol stimulates our breathing. I'm not saying for people to become teetotalers. I'm not a teetotaler, but I do understand the effect. And sometimes I ask myself, is it worth it? I have a couple of drinks. I don't want to be suffering the next day, put it that way. <laughs> you know, I saw a study that children up to 55%, 58% are mouth breathers. But there was a study in Japan that less than 20% are mouth breathers. Uh, how about in the U.S.? Well, I mean, you're in Ireland, but I don't know if you know about the U.S. What percentage of Americans? I mean, there's a big there's a big problem with a, almost two thirds of the population in the U.S. is overweight. And, you know, there's a lot of obesity here. So I would imagine a lot of people are mouth breathers in, in the U.S. And I don't know if, if there's any statistics. And if you could go over that and again, go over the symptoms of mouth breathing and later on in the podcast i'm going to ask you to uh for to, what we could do to help these people some exercises but i want to before we get there i just want to establish the symptoms and the problems with mouth breathing and we have to understand that this is one piece of the puzzle it's not always the it's not you know it's not the magic bullet for everything but when it comes to health there's a lot of parts to health uh, for 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 making people healthy, whether it's diet, ex exercise, uh, breathing is part of it. So there's a lot of things that that are sleep, of course, stress reduction. 
there's a lot that's involved. And this is a piece of the puzzle that I think is an important piece that has been overlooked, just like being out in the sun. Uh, you know, Jack Cruz talks about being out in the sun, and we've done podcasts on the, the power of the sun in conventional medicine. We don't look at that. And in conventional medicine, we're not looking at the power of breathing, although we're doing it. I don't know how many how many breaths we take a day, but it's a lot. So it's something that we absolutely have to look at. So if we could just review maybe statistics of how many people breathe incorrectly, and again, the symptoms and uh, of breathing incorrectly. It's funny, you know, I don't have any statistics on the United States um, when it comes to breathing. I would have to think that there, it's going to comparable be comparable with, with European statistics. And the thing about mouth breathing, how is it measured? And is there standardization amongst the studies? Like, how do you quantify somebody who's a mouth breather versus a nose breather? Statistics are few and far between. It typically ranges for children between 25 to 50% of study children. I've only came across two studies investigating mouth breathing in adults, and both studies show 17%. One study actually was done by the Brett Institute in Los Angeles. And there are some amazing doctors and orthodontists in the United States who understand. There's an academy called the American Academy of Physiological Medicine and Dentistry. And normally when we meet, you could have five, 600 medical professionals. Um, it can be sleep doctors and orthodontists and dentists and other disciplines, speech, language, pathology, et cetera. They all understand the impact of mouth breathing. How would it affect a normal person? Well, if you think about a child, crooked teeth is relatively new. You know, our ancestors, if you were to look at a skull, say going back 5,000 years ago or 10,000 years ago, there wasn't overcrowding of teeth. The jaws were big enough to house all of the teeth. And there should be no reason why we as human beings that we're not able to house all 32 teeth. The problem is with crooked teeth is that it points that the jaws are too small. When the jaws are too small, there's not enough room to house the tongue. This in turn, the tongue is going to encroach the airway. The mouth and the jaws haven't developed the way they should have. And when we think about development of the jaws, I have a poor facial structure. My nose is bent. You can see that because my maxilla is set back. And because my top jaw is set back, my mandible is set back. And as a result, I'll have a double chin. A double chin is not just, it doesn't just look poor. It's actually not a good indicator of health. And we as human beings, Let's be real about it. We do choose our partners based on looks. You know, we do. We, we give it some consideration. There's no question when you're, you're dating and you're in your whatever age, you will also consider, you will always consider how appealing does that individual look? Then we have to think about, well, what constitutes good looks? High cheekbones, forward growth of the jaws, straight teeth not a long facial structure and a good looking face is a healthy face. So I think that we are selecting our baits or we are selecting our partners based on looks to make sure that the children that we produce are going to be healthy children. We want to select a healthy partner. And in order to select a healthy partner, we, we select a good looking partner. And now I know some people will be giving out with what I said there, but I think there's some truth in it. Absolutely. If, you, if you see somebody who has had a hard life, you'll see it in their face. And if you see somebody with their, their generations, previous generations have had hard lives, you will also see it there. So we do pass it down. So your second part of the question, what would be the common symptoms of open mouth breathing? Poor dental health um, because the mouth is dry. So children are more and adults are more prone to dental cavities and gum disease. Now, the other aspect of this is because of a dry mouth, it's going to impact the microbiome because whatever we swallow, it's going to impact. So the, the mouth can affect the gut. That's one aspect. So dental health, overcrowding of teeth. So if a child is undergoing orthodontic treatment, it's very important that that child also restores nasal breathing because it's the tongue that will have to maintain 
the shape of the face going forward. Sleep, sleep issues, endemic. You know, how many people are snoring? How many people have obstructive sleep apnea? Anxiety and panic disorder from mouth breathing and how it feeds into it. And again, I do agree with you. There's many things to the puzzle. You know, there's, I'm not going to say that breathing is, is absolutely a magic bullet. It's not, but it's a tool. There's something lovely about it. It's always with us. And when you start changing your breathing patterns, for me, the biggest benefit that I've got personally from it is it's able to induce a state of calmness of the mind. And it's tremendous because if we stress is problematic, high stress levels will affect our sleep, will affect our eating habit, our drinking habits, our lack of exercise, our quality of life, our longevity. High stress contributes to inflammation. And if we can help to reduce stress by any means possible, it's a good thing. And you, people that yawn and they sigh all the time, that many times is a sign of mouth breathing. It's, I would see that is frequent yawning and frequent sighing is a sign of poor breathing patterns. Absolutely. Because we have to ask, why is the person sighing frequently? They are sighing because they feel uncomfortable. And they may feel uncomfortable because of the air hunger associated with their breathing. But why are they having air hunger? It's because they have a strong chemosensitivity to carbon dioxide. In other words, their breathing is faulty from a biochemical point of view. So that's why it's important to change their breathing. You know, I was fascinated by this study that was in your book, uh, this Minneapolis study of people that have had heart attacks. And 75% of those people that have had yes. heart attacks are mouth breathers, and 100% were upper chest breathers, and 70% were mouth breathers during sleep. And in Dr. Lum, uh, his book, he goes through all these different uh, different organ systems, how poor breathing could affect every organ system. And I was wondering if you could comment on that, respiratory, cardiovascular, muscle, GI, neurological, psychological, just some of those symptoms as well. Because, you know, people watching this, I think it's important that they understand that this is a piece of the puzzle. And it, it takes time, and we're going to talk about exercises, but it takes time to learn how to do this correctly, because I know it took me time, how to really internalize it. It's it, this Eventually, it just happened. It didn't happen by me practicing it once or twice. It took me a, a good month, maybe even six weeks two, or two months to be able to do it where I breathe and now my diaphragm goes out when I nose breathe in rather than my stomach going in when I breathe in. And I think most people, their stomach goes in. Uh, and I'm not sure why that is. I don't know if there's a reason for that, but you know, not to go down the rabbit hole, but I just want to establish all the different uh, that Dr. Lum's research or in his book that he showed that faulty uh, breathing could affect all organ systems. And if you could just comment on that. Yeah, he coined a phrase called the fat file syndrome. He said there's a group of patients going from doctor to doctor. They have symptoms. The doctor is doing various tests, but the tests are coming back negative. And he was saying that the problem that can be contributing to their symptoms is chronic overbreathing. So that's why he called it fat file syndrome. He said that hyperventilation syndrome it can affect any organ or system to different degrees. And very often, these individuals can be labeled as hypochondriacs because hyperventilation, it will affect more than just sleep. It can affect the state of mind. It can affect breathing. You're feeling uncomfortable with your breathing. And then if you have a patient going into a doctor and they're exhibiting one symptom after another and the doctor is thinking, well, all of the tests are negative, but what's going on? Put it the doctor often is not going to consider their underlying breathing pattern. So Claude Lum was a physician at Papward Hospital in Cambridge in the United Kingdom. And he wrote a paper back in 1975, which is kind of scary. It's almost 50 years ago, called Hyperventilation, the Tip of the Iceberg. Coming back to cardiovascular health, there is a, a doctor called Bernardi. Can't think of his first name. I know it begins with L. He was working with his patients with chronic heart failure, and he was noticing that they were getting very breathless during physical exercise. He asked the question, he asked, was it their chronic heart failure which was causing them to be overly breathless during physical exercise, 
or did they have poor breathing patterns which was feeding into their overly breathless during physical exercise now it would be normal for a cardiologist and a doctor to consider i have a patient with chronic heart failure the patient isn't breathing well during physical exercise and it would be normal for the doctor to say it's the chronic heart failure which is causing the problematic breathing during exercise but bernardi said no let's change their breathing patterns let's have his patients slow down their breathing reduce the chemo sensitivity to carbon dioxide strengthen the barrel reflex and then when they do physical exercise they have less breathlessness now if you put in bernardi into pubmed I think he's 500 to 1,000 published papers. So this is a well-published doctor. I just can't think of his first name, but it's in the book. So there is a connection between the respiratory system and the cardiovascular system. The cardiovascular system is influencing the respiratory system, but the respiratory system has an even greater influence over the cardiovascular system. So when we think of our heart, it's not just that the heart is pumping blood throughout the body, but the heart needs its own blood supply and oxygen delivery. And if we are breathing abnormally, that's causing vasoconstriction, we can be reducing blood flow to the heart. There's an interesting paper that was written by two anesthetists. It's a review article. It's published in the New England Journal of Medicine in 2002. The paper is called hypocapnia, which is low carbon dioxide. They have a section of the impact of hyperventilation on cardiovascular health. So it can influence electrocardiogram rhythms. I know there has been at least one paper looking at the connection between hyperventilation and heart attack. And it would come back to this, Dr. Gal. I think anybody who is doing physical exercise, we should be breathing in and out through our nose, especially as we get older, because the nose will limit our intensity of exercise and could prevent us from hyperventilating during exercise because exercise, if we push ourselves too much to the point of hyperventilation, could it be too much for the heart? So it's just a question that I put out there. And I, I think it's interesting with muscle pain, cramping, twitching, uh, muscle weakness, stiffness, muscle spasms. I guess it all could relate in some part to not getting enough oxygen to those parts of the body. It can. You know, I haven't came across so many papers discussing it. There was one by an ear, nose and throat doctor called Dr. James Bartley, and he wrote a paper called Breathing and Temporomandibular Joint Pain. So TMJ pain is more common in females than men. And he spoke about chronic facial pain is a stress to people. And because of that chronic facial pain, you're likely to be breathing faster and harder, which in turn is increasing blood pH which in turn is heightening pain perception and lowering pain threshold, which is feeding back into the condition. But he also talked about increased lactic acid and muscle tension as a result of that as well. So there's, I can't think straight off the top of my head of other papers, but that's the one that comes to mind. Um, and there have been a number of studies done more, even more recently. They've had individuals, they exposed them to a hot temperature to induce pain, but they had them do different breathing rates. And they found that when you really soften and slow down your breathing, it helps to reduce pain perception. You talk in your book about sports and exercise, the proper, and you've mentioned it a few times so far, the proper way to breathe for sports. And, you know, in the United States, you know, obviously baseball, football, basketball, tennis, these are, the, you know, some of the big sports that people watch golf. And a lot of times the baseball player is coming up to bat and he takes a big breath through his mouth <laughs> and blow, blows out through his mouth. And, and I think in your book, it said about 90% of the athletes or people when they exercise are breathing incorrectly and they're breathing through their mouth. They're not breathing through the nose. So if you're playing sports at a high level, and even if you're going to the gym like me, how should people be breathing? Let's first take high level sports. I guess in Europe would be soccer, uh, you know, uh, fo uh, football for you guys, uh, for us, baseball and American football, uh, basketball, et cetera. And they tell the kids, you know, I have a 13 year old who plays baseball. They say, take a big breath before you pitch through your mouth and a big breath when you're about to hit. So I think they're doing it wrong, aren't they? 
you one would have to ask what is the reasoning behind it you know like why would you encourage a young child to be taking that full big breath maybe it's to take the child's attention that they're not going to become overly anxious about the the pitch etc um so it may be more of a distraction than anything else a full big breath here and there i wouldn't be too worried about it but if we were looking at the bigger scheme of things how we breathe during physical exercise is determined by how we breathe during rest. And if we have 40 breathing patterns during rest, it's not going to automatically correct itself when we do physical exercise. MacU Health, your science born and tested solutions for visual performance, macular degeneration, and dry eye syndrome. New products coming soon. Embrace the science. Let's get back to the baseball player. So the pitcher is on the mound, he's pitching, and they're telling him to take a breath. But the breath, how should the breath be at that point? What would you feel that should be the best way to take that breath? And how big, I mean, obviously it should be through the nose, but how much through the nose should be a small breath? Or it should be a little bigger breath than usual. What do you think would be best to get the ox to improve the oxygen and improve the concentration of the ball player? But say if a, if a ball player is feeling a little bit anxious and their heart rate is a little bit elevated, it's very important to help to bring a calmness to downregulate there. And all you have to do is take a soft breath in through the nose and a relaxed and slow, gentle breath out. It's as simple as that, but there's nothing to see. And that's the beauty of it. You know, I work with, I'll give you an example. Um, I work with some occupations, including police and military. And I've been brought in to work with snipers. So these are European police force and snipers would be there in case there was a hostage situation. And these are highly trained army rangers, special operations forces. And I'm brought in to work with concentration, but also to work with self-regulation. So you can imagine somebody behind the sight of a rifle. And this is just an example that we can then kind of relate to sports. A 30-year-old in behind the sight of a rifle, stressful situation. Their heart rate is up to about 150 beats per minute. That's too high. That's going to knock them off target. So what I do is simply have them do what I explained. Soft breath in through the nose and a really relaxed, slow, gentle breath out. And the whole purpose of the slow, relaxed, gentle breath out is to slow down the speed of the heart rate because the trigger is pulled in between heartbeats because it's more accurate. If the trigger is pulled on a heartbeat, it will knock the person off target. So it's about self-regulation using the breath. And it's also in terms of having a focused and concentrated mind. We are often as human beings, we're often very critical of ourselves. We're often very much living in our minds. And a lot of the stuff that goes on in our minds, it's not helpful. But we don't often see this because we don't pay attention to what's going on in, in the mind in the first place. So in a situation like a baseball player, I'd be saying to that individual, I need you to work not just on your physical performance, but your breathing performance, because that will tie in also with your mental performance. I don't want that player 15 or 20 minutes into the game when they may have some physical fatigue that their mind is wandering somewhere else. But how do you train that individual for the game? That training is in the weeks and the months leading up to the game. Now, you think of a 13-year-old child. These children, I have a 13-year-old here as well. These kids are brought up with cell phones. You know, they're, and like it or love it, um, the kid is going to have a cell phone. That's the way it is. And they are scrolling and they're on social media, they're on their TikTok, they're on whatever. And it's a very superficial scrolling. There's no deep learning in it. It's almost as if it's just scroll, 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 scroll. There's, it's almost that they are just skimming the surface and just cherry picking a little bit here and a little bit there. But it's their mind is quite active while doing that. It's not like reading a book. It's a different concentration or focus while reading a book versus this. But the problem with too much scrolling is that it could be training the brain to be distracted and it could be stealing our focus. So if the child is on a phone, it could be one hour a day, two hours a day, three hours a day. It, that's realistic enough with many, many children. Well, if you're practicing distraction for three hours a day, 
you're not going to have a concentrated mind out on the pitch. I would also have a fault with education, Dr. Galb. I don't think education is teaching children and giving them the life skills. You know, we all spend 12, 14, whatever years in formal education. We are not taught how to concentrate. I had terrible concentration in school. Nobody took into consideration the fact that I was a mouth breather, the fact that I had sleep disorder breathing. And, you know, we're expecting children to do well academically without looking at their underlying physiology. And we're not teaching these children, how do you actually direct your attention? Like what is concentration, but the ability to hold your attention on a subject matter for a period of time. And of course, that's going to take into consideration your attention span. And for me, it's the most vital tool in life. But if we have a lot of internal monologue, in other words, education has trained us how to think, but now we're stuck in our head and we are ruminating and we are thinking to the point that we don't have a degree over, of control of where we want to direct our attention. And this is where breathing could be coming in because when we have our attention on the breath, we're directing our attention from the thinking mind to holding our attention on our breathing. And if we can develop that skill then over a period of time, we then have the capacity to direct that attention to whatever subject matter that we want to put it upon. An overthinking mind is an anxious mind and people who overthink are less happy. And here we have the stress tied in. Now, I work with athletes, too, you know, and I work with boxers and some of them are world class boxers. And I'm saying to these guys, listen, you're in there on the eighth round. I don't I need you to be fighting with every cell of your body. I don't want your thinking mind to be getting in the way because the thinking mind is too slow it's too critical and it will sabotage you. But these skills are not just for the ring. These skills are for our everyday life. And I think a while ago I pointed that if I was to say what was the most important thing that I got out of this on a personal basis was the ability to be able to bring a quietness and stillness to the mind to direct my attention to where I want to direct it upon. And now of course the mind will go off in a train of thought. But you notice it and also you've got less thinking and we can learn how to reduce our thinking and our thought activity and even if we were to reduce our thought activity by 20 percent it would be enormous in terms of improving quality of life and how much time during the day do you think should be devoted to breathing exercises to be able to even once you learn to breathe properly i notice myself i still want to do those breathing exercises when I can. Uh, and, you know, I'll steal some time here. I'll steal some time there. And even as you're, as I'm listening to you, I'm doing my breathing exercises uh, to, to concentrate, to do it properly because I've seen such a benefit in myself. So uh, if you could talk about that, like you, the kids, maybe adults, how much time, when should they do it? Uh, and, you know, when they're scrolling, I mean, you know, that's that's a real that's a real issue for me. But, you know, it's you know, you're fighting a, a losing battle in many ways. Yeah, no, I agree. It's not easy. Um, and that's the thing about we have to be realistic. 20 years ago, I used to ask my clients, my students coming in and I would like them to do one hour per day. Now, that was 20 years ago and I could found that they, I could I found that they could do it. Now they can't. They don't have an hour. So I have to think about, well, what do I do in terms of my daily life? When I get up in the morning, I have my cup of coffee and then I go on to a cross trainer. So I have some gym equipment here in my own office and I spend 30 minutes on the cross trainer and I'm breathing in and out through my nose. I'm breathing slow and breathing low. So I'm doing physical exercise with nasal breathing. So now I'm doing physical exercise, but I'm also doing breathing exercise. And I will do a few breath holds as well during that physical exercise. So whereby I purposely stop breathing to lower my blood oxygen saturation and increase carbon dioxide as a slight stress response. The other thing is I do that physical exercise. I don't want to do that physical exercise with my thinking mind. I genuinely disperse my attention throughout the body and I exercise with every cell of my body. So now I'm training the brain. And that's 30 minutes. Now, people don't have time for physical exercise and don't have time for meditation and they don't have time for breathing exercise. 
get out for a walk, go to your gym, do whatever you are doing. But don't do your physical exercise with your attention stuck in your head, just going through the motions. Give yourself some attention. Don't even have a video screen on whereby you're looking at something on the television screen. Forget about that. Bring your attention inwards. The body craves attention. And if we have an ability to bring our attention out of our mind and disperse it throughout the body, then if I'm going out on stage to do a public talk, I will do that because I don't want to go out on stage with a thinking mind because the wrong stuff will come into my head and I'll make a mess of it. So I use these little things in my own way of life to prepare me then for when I need them. And there's a comfort in knowing then I can rely on them. So come at one o'clock, I'll have something to eat. Very often what I'll do is I'll play a 20 minute relaxation audio. And I lie down after lunch and I lie down and listen to it and I'll soften and slow down my breathing to the point of a tolerable air hunger to induce relaxation for that 20 minutes. But that will give me energy then to be more focused and more productive. And I actually did it before we come on today because we were meeting, I think, at two o'clock. So I did my 20 minutes and I finished at 10 minutes to two and then I signed in. It gives you great energy then in the afternoon. For me, it's a great 20 minutes. It's a breathing exercise, but it's also re-energy. Tonight, I wear tape. Now, I'll show you the tape that I wear because sometimes people are a little bit gassed when they, when they think of taping. We use a tape now. It's my own tape. Um, this tape here, it surrounds the mouth. Is this the Mayo tape? Correct. Yeah. This and is if, the one. If people want to buy this type of Mayo tape, can they go online and get it? They can, and it's it's pretty inexpensive. Um, it's twenty five dollars for three months supply. Uh huh. This one here is for beards, so it's black and it's a little bit stickier, and you stretch it about thirty percent, and then you adhere it to the face. And there's an elastic tension created by the tape, which is pulling my lips together, but it's safe, because it's important for people with moderate to severe sleep apnea. If they have to open their mouth, you need them to be able to open their mouth. So you don't want to just cover their lips. And that's my routine. Now, there are times, just as you said, you were listening to me a while ago. You said that you brought some attention onto your breathing. That's what it's all about. It's not about the formal practice. Nobody will do a formal practice indefinitely. I don't do it myself, so I can't expect my students to do it. And I'm time poor, and so are my students. So what I want to do is I want to see where can we bring it into somebody's way of life that they actually get the benefit. They find it easy to apply, but we can develop a habit. And like I like I will say hands up, you know, there was a time that my workload was so busy and exercise went out the window and I was getting up and I was working from five o'clock in the morning. And then I started to become a little bit resentful. I'm just thinking, why on earth? I'm working 10, 12 hours a day and I'm not giving myself any attention. And then whatever, I must have heard something or whatever, I decided that's it. When I get up in the morning, the time, the first two hours is for me. And it gives me a tremendous state frame of mind then to work for the rest of the day. So if I get up at six o'clock or five o'clock, I spend my 30 minutes on the cross trainer. I do some weights and then I have an infrared sauna and I jump into that. And sometimes I play an audio in the infrared and I will listen to that and go into relaxation. So I have my sauna, my breathing exercise there as well. Don't always get to do the sauna. So yeah, like you, nobody, the thing about breathing is you don't need anything. You can go for a walk with your mouth closed. It is one of the best exercise. If you're doing yoga, do it with in and out through the nose with silent breathing, tremendous exercise, any sort of movement. Do it with your mouth closed and gently soften your breathing. And don't just do your physical exercise with your attention stuck in your head. Do your exercise with every cell of your body. And how about weightlifting? Is there a different way of breathing? Because, you know, you see the weightlifters and they're blowing out through their mouth. And does it change with weightlifting or is it the same thing through the nose gently? But you, you, but you know, if you're going to be lifting heavy weights, how does that change things? It's a little bit different with weightlifting because normally when a weightlifter, when you're exerting the weight, what you will do is 
you will breathe in and you hold your breath for a brief period of time because as you breathe in, there's a negative pressure created in the, in the, in the thorax, but there's a positive pressure created in the abdomen. So as the diaphragm is moving downwards, it almost like the abdomen becomes like a pneumatic balloon and provides stabilization for the spine. So you do hold your breath for a brief period of time, especially when exerting the, the, the weight. Other than that, we don't have a whole lot of guidance. We would like to see weightlifters with good functional breathing because weightlifters do need the support of their diaphragm. And you spoke about a paper that was looking at 1,933 athletes in Japan, and they found that 90% of these athletes, this was published in the Journal of Strength and Conditioning Research, 90% of these athletes have dysfunctional breathing from a biomechanical point of view. In other words, they are breathing high. Now, the problem with breathing high is that you don't have adequate recruitment of the diaphragm. You're not generating sufficient intra-abdominal pressure and you're not getting that stabilization. So I would say to a weightlifter, look at your everyday breathing, improve that, and then breathe normally in and out through the nose. But breathe, it's not about over breathing. You know, it doesn't make sense for people to be over breathing during physical exercise. Breathe according to what you need. And before we go into the different techniques, we talk a little bit about more about the tape and about the belt. I do want to establish how people could measure whether their breathing is good or not with the Bolt score, the body oxygen level test, the body oxygen level test, the Bolt score. If you could explain how to do that test, what's a good number? I did mine. I'm around 28, which I thought, I guess is okay. You know, we want good. to... 40 is, be is better, but at least it's not under 20 or in the teens. So if you could explain that and uh, as a test for people at home listening, learn what your bolt score is, and then we're going to go over some exercises how to improve your breathing. So your bolt score is a test that we use for adults. And you're sitting down for about five minutes or so with normal breathing. You take a normal breath in and out through your nose, and then you hold your nose to stop breathing. So you pinch your nostrils to stop breathing and you time it in seconds. How long does it take until you feel the first definite desire to breathe? And then when you let go, your breathing should be pretty normal. In other words, it's not a maximum length of time. It's a comfortable breath hold time. So it's a measurement of the length of time that you can hold your breath for comfortably and still have normal breathing when you resume breathing. Professor Kyle Kiesel is professor of physical therapy, I think at Evansville University in the United States. He did a study on breath hold time in 2020. He looked at 51 individuals. He assessed their breathing from a biochemical, a biomechanical, and a psychophysiological dimension. In other words, he looked at their breathing in pretty much in pretty good detail. And he concluded that if your breath hold time is above 25 seconds, there is an 89% chance that your breathing is functional. Now, if somebody has a bolt score of say 20 seconds, yeah, they're close, they're getting there. But when I look at people with, say, long COVID, and these individuals genuinely have had the worst, the lowest bowl scores that I've experienced in my 21 years. Some of them have had bowl scores of as low as three and four seconds. Wow. They can't talk a sentence. They're breathing high in the upper chest. They're feeling very uncomfortable with their breathing. They're sighing. You know, they're feeling that suffocation feeling. The thing about the bolt score is your bolt score gives you feedback. It's an indirect feedback of your chemosensitivity to carbon dioxide. Now, what is the relationship between this and the autonomic nervous system? Your sensitivity to carbon dioxide is related to your sensitivity of the barrel reflex. If you've got a strong chemosensitivity to carbon dioxide, your bolt score is low. And when you have a strong chemosensitivity to carbon dioxide, you've got a reduced barrel reflex sensitivity. And this is implying that your autonomic nervous system is in an increased stress response and you're more vulnerable to cardiovascular issues. So the bolt score is important. More, you're becoming more sympathetic. Correct. That's exactly it. And the bolt score, it's not perfect, but it gives you some indication of how hard and fast you're breathing during rest. And those individuals with a low bolt score are going to have more disproportionate breathing during physical exercise. Their breathing is uncomfortable 
and I would say that they will have reduced resilience and reduced what's called heart rate variability, which is an objective measurement of resilience. So that's the bold score. Um, if people are looking for the description, just go into YouTube and put in how to measure bold score, or we have an app which is free and everything inside it is free. And it's called Oxygen Advantage, if you don't mind me saying it. But sure. you can measure you can measure the bold score in that. Your eyes and your vision are under attack, damaging blue light from the sun. Your phone, your computer, your tablet, even light bulbs and car headlights is constantly bombarding you. The good news is our eyes actually already have a line of defense to counter the effects of blue light. This defense is made up of three pigments called carotenoids. MacU Health with Micromycel, the only supplement with the exclusive patent on all three macular carotenoids and micromycel technology. Fitting multifocal contact lenses presents a big opportunity to meet patient needs while growing your practice. Alcon is your partner not only with our innovative portfolio, but through e-learning. Learn to enhance your multifocal strategy today with the Alcon Experience Academy. OIE Broadcasting is the emerging leader in social media. We use scientific entertainment to drive more patients into your office. Visit oiebroadcasting.com and sign up today.